Tom, Sean, welcome to E3. Thank you. So Sean, I just saying backstage, I feel like it's every year we get a new uh, <laughs> Not new every game. year, but every couple of years. Every yeah, I, years. I feel like, um, I, I, you know, I feel lucky to have been a part of some, uh, some pretty incredible games with yeah. uh, fantastic storytellers. I mean, Supermassive, who did this, was, uh, uh, I, I was tracking Until Dawn when I was making Quantum Break because yep. it was sort of like the motion capture, the performance, that was something that yep. was a huge interest to me as an actor that our, uh, you know, performances can be translated, uh, you know, from mocap to, to players' hands. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it's very exciting. Yeah, no, uh, Tom, as, as Sean said, I mean, Until Dawn, such a, an amazing game. I think it's aged very well, too. I think a lot, I know I've talked to a lot of people that go back and still play it because mm. it's such an incredible experience. Um, tell us kind of, you know, moving on to this project, um, you know, horror genre, deep narrative, as I said, Until Dawn. This, is this kind of a spiritual successor to that or I mean how do you how do you treat because it? it's certainly a genre that I think you guys are uniquely sort of I mean yeah out. kind of well I mean we we learn a massive amount from Until Dawn yeah. uh, it was a big learning whole process for our studio I mean in all in all areas of, of, of game production uh, one, once we'd done that we we kind of sat around and said what do we want to do next uh, and uh, we're big horror fans we play a lot of horror games we watch a lot of horror films it's where it's where our heart is as a studio and we sat down and kind of riffed through all the various ideas. Uh, horror has a lot of, of, of subgenres, yeah. uh, and, and you know, not until dawn was one of those was one of those subgenres. So we kind of made this list. We got to about 39 <laughs> subgenres of horror, and uh, and one uh, one idea that came about was, well, why, why can't we do all of these? So that was the idea of the anthology that we would make a series of games yep. exploring these different subgenres using what we'd learned from Until Dawn. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what you learned from Until Dawn, wh what did you want to do differently for this one, or what were you sort of approaching in, like, you know? Uh, uh, well, there was a bunch of things. I mean, wh one of the things that uh, really surprised us when we released the game was, was uh, the people streaming it and, the, and, and people yep. watching it over streaming services and engaging with the game right. uh, in that way. That we, we, had, we didn't really anticipate that. It was a long development. We were kind of deep in it. We missed that whole... Uh, development. So, but it was cool. I mean, it's, you know, just to, to I, I literally came home on the day it was released and, and, and turned on my uh, PS4 and, and, and just, you know, hundreds of people streaming the game. And yeah. that was an incredible experience. So that was one thing was the way that, uh, the, the way that the audience engaged with the game, not just the game, but with the stuff outside the game. Yeah. And they, they engaged with the way the characters related to each other. You know, they kind of worked out not just the relationships that we planned, but uh, uh, other, other relationships between the, the characters. So, so those were things that surprised us. Mm -hmm. And then we tried to work out, okay, well, they were cool things. How can we develop those? How can we deepen those systems? Uh, we were pretty happy with... Uh, the branching in our game and the way that the narrative kind of twists and turns, uh, turns around. And one of our, our key plans going into Man of Medan and the rest of the, the Dark Picture series was to, to really expand that branching and really deepen it. So, so it's, a, an, it's an extremely branching narrative, much more so than, than Until Dawn. And there's a skill to producing that, so it was, you know, kind of how can we do that but even better. And even for you, Sean, as an actor, with more branches means kind of more things to keep in your head to understand where this is all going. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think the first script that I got was a thousand pages. I mean, it was this massive, and I was like, how are we going to get through all this? And that's one of the major differences, too, between film and television and, and video games is, is the length of script and because of the branching narratives. But what is, from a performance perspective, what's interesting is, as opposed to a film and television script where here's the arc, here's the story, you start here, you know, the journey is this, the story is this. So you prepare your character based on that sort of one storyline. With a video game with all this branching story, you actually, uh, in a way, get to spend more time exploring this character because you're looking at all the different paths. Like, well, what if he goes this way? What if he makes a choice that makes him more of a villain in the story? Well, then you start to explore the darker side of this character. Well, what if he become, the player chooses a, a more heroic aspect of this guy? So you really get to see all the varieties of who these, who these characters could be, the possibilities of that, which is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. And the other thing, too, that I had fun with this game in particular is that, you know, Supermassive, this is a bold story. So to come into a horror story um, and play a character who is kind of, I, I, I play this character named Conrad, who's this American tourist who's kind of brash. He's not the nicest guy in the world. Um, but 
in a survival type scenario and almost in a detective type scenario where you're exploring this world, it's kind of nice to have a character that, that has no filter, that's just going to jump in and, and yeah. start, uh, you know, stirring, stirring things up. So it was fun. Um, you know, going through this and, and building this world, um, tell us a bit about kind of the setting of it, Tom, and kind of, you know, Conrad obviously is a character, but how does Sean's character fit into this? Okay, so, there's a, so the setting is there's like, uh, there's four American uh, guys who are on a holiday, a diving holiday in the South Pacific. They, they, they kind of know each other. Conrad is there with his sister, and uh, who's Julia, and, and she's there with her boyfriend, and then Alex, and then he's there with his brother. So some of them know each other. Uh, some of them have never met, but they're, they're there on this holiday. They've got the skipper of the boat, who's called Fliss, uh, joins them, and they go out diving. That's, that's what they do. And they find this World War II plane wreck at the bottom of the ocean. It's kind of what they were looking for. They're very excited about it. They go on a dive down there, and they find something and bring it back up to the surface. Uh, and that is a mistake. That's, that's something they, sh <laughs> they shouldn't have done. The first mistake. Yeah, that's the first, first mistake. mistake. You, yeah. you, you don't do that. <laughs> um, and because it's a, a horror game, things kind of go bad quite quickly mm -hmm. uh, after that. And they end up on this huge freighter, this World War II freighter, which is anchored in the middle of the uh, Pacific. It's rusting, it's abandoned, yeah. uh, and they're stuck there. Their engine's out, they haven't got any radio contact. They don't know what to do. And as they explore inside this kind of massive space, they, they find there's something there, and that there's a backstory, and there's something there, and they're going to have to fight to get out alive. And, that's, and then you, as the player, yeah. you have to get them out alive. That's your job. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. And so when you're recording this, Sean, you mentioned you know, a 1,000-page script. You didn't know how you were going to get through it. You got through it somehow. So yeah. What was that experience like? Um, again, daunting. I mean, you look yeah. at that much dialogue and, and the, the branching content. I think what these guys did really well for the actors was A, create sort of like a lookbook of um, reference photos for what the environment's going to be like. Because yeah. when you're doing a motion capture uh, performance, you're basically just in a warehouse with actors and some technicians. So there's nothing to, to refer to. Whereas if you're on a movie set, you've got the lighting, you've got the props, you've got yeah. all these things. So First and foremost, the, the research they did and the sort of lookbooks that they created for us were, were fantastic. Um, the other thing that's challenging in one way but also very freeing is that there are no other distractions, just the actors, the director, the technicians in a room. And so as opposed to having to be like rooted on spot on a mark where the cameras need to be, you can move around a lot. You know? And so uh, I think specifically in horror uh, performances, it's all about this fear, but that usually comes from a physicality. Your yeah. heart's up, you're sweating, and we were allowed to move around a lot. Um, so that was cool. And really? It's, it's, so it's physicality, that's interesting. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, and I, I've done a, quite a few sort of horror things in the past, and it's such a difficult emotion to um, replicate because it really does come from, you know, a physical response. Um, you know, all your, you know, neurons are firing. And again, I, when I sit in a horror film and there's a big jump scare or whatever, yeah. I sweat, you know, yeah. I just, or my heart's racing. And it's, I think, to try to um, replicate that, there's a physicality. You can sort of cheat, you know, by getting your blood up and, and sort of doing that. So that was kind of a really unique thing while doing a motion capture performance is that we were allowed to move around a little bit and we have this space that you could just interact. You and, should... and it was, and, but also, there's no other distractions. The script, yeah. the director, the actors, you're all there. Um, and again, it's not about like, okay, we're, we're running a take and if you mess it up, then we have to start all over again. Yeah. Um, you can just sort of run it. Um, and there's a lot of freedom to that, that that I think allowed us to get through a lot of material and um, efficiently and effectively. Like feel like, oh, we really did right. that. You can wing it a little bit. Um, just if you want to jump back in a scene and start over, or you've gotten ramped up to emotional state, you know, the first take, well, we're not quite there. You build up, you build up, you build up. Okay, take six, we're on it, yeah. and we can just roll right through it. And you're like, oh, that's the one that works, because wow. we've, we've built up this performance. It's, it's so important for us uh, as a studio to get these really great uh, performances. We, you know, we're getting top actors in, people like Sean, and, and it's about creating that space where they can be creative, where they can come along and bring their interpretation of the character Really important. Yeah. Um, you know, Sean's talked about the branching. I'm curious, from your perspective, Tom, developing it, I mean, 
does this game have an insane number of endings? Or tell us about <laughs> sort of the, the extre you know, how far the branches go. It is, it's easily the most branching game we've done. Wow. And it, and it, uh, it, how it, many endings? Uh, it, it's difficult to quantify the number of endings yeah. because yeah. there's a lot of permutations. And it's not, there's maybe, the, the, there's several completely different endings. But within right. each of those, there are, there are different ways that those endings can, can play out. Yep. So there's, there's differences even within the individual endings. Right. And then there might be, you know, we have this rule, everyone can live and everyone can die. So we kind of, as developers, we don't know Is that your rule? who's everyone there. Can that, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. everyone can live, everyone can die. We don't know who's going to be there at that ending. And we have to kind of make that work. So you can get rid of well. Sean pretty early in the you, game if you, you want. You, you <laughs> can get rid of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, say, Please don't kill me. Please don't <laughs> say. Well, it's, you know, you look at like obviously Bandersnatch and what they were doing was sort of branching interactive narrative. And I think, you know, you're in a space where, you know, I remember the old FMV video games, but it's like you're, what I love is that you guys are doing it with incredible graphics. It's still fully interactive, right? Mm -hmm. And then everyone's like, Banner's Snatch, people like, oh, we've never seen this before. And it's like, actually, like, <laughs> you guys have been, yeah, you know, this. Yeah. doing this and doing this much better for a while. And something like Until Dawn, there's just so much more possibility when things are digital versus having to have so many fixed sort mm -hmm. of uh, endings. So the appeal of doing more branches is that to make the player have more agency feel the story is more their own? Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, if, if a player's chosen to play our game yeah. and we ask them to, to uh, make a choice or, d or do something, then we have to pay attention to, to what they're doing. If we don't yeah. branch there, then that means it didn't, it didn't really matter. Right. So every time we, we give you some interaction, we're kind of creating a branch at that point. It might be quite a small branch. It might just be how you, a different player, th a different character right. thinks about you or, or, or something like that, but it might be massive. It might be life or death or the story might veer off into yeah. uh, another direction entirely. How do you go about writing that? Like oh, keeping it straight <laughs> yeah. in your head, right? Well, we don't try and keep it straight in our head. That's the okay. first thing. That was, that was okay. our first okay. attempt. We a lot wrote, of flow charts at the office. Yeah. <laughs> we, we wrote documents in Word and stuff, and that didn't really work. Uh, I mean, the first thing we do is we try and get to a really good story uh, with really strong characters. And we don't worry too much about the, the branching. We just say, yeah. what's our story? What story are we trying to tell? Why are we trying to tell it? Uh, and who's going to be in it? And, and how will they develop? What are their arcs? And things like this. Very conventional yeah. narrative stuff. Once, once we're really happy with that, we think that's going to that's going to be really cool. Then we start to think about the branching, and it's really just looking at every element of that of that story and saying, well, what if the player decides to do this instead? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then we we have to think that through and, uh, and and make sure that what happens sometimes is we'll get some really cool event on, on one branch. And that, that kind of becomes a favorite branch. Well, that's, well, I hope everyone does that. Mm, yeah. And then we have to say, no, we need something that's just as cool mm -hmm. over here. And, we, and that can be difficult to do sometimes. Yep. So there's a, there's a kind of big thought process about how, how to make, uh, kind of break this into a series of really interesting stories. And then we've got a, a tool we developed in-house, kind of a, a big flow tool, very, very complicated. And yeah. uh, we, just, we can just write out the story in this flow tool and put some you know, uh, storyboards or whatever in there, and we can play the game. We can play the whole game ah, in this yeah. very kind of basic way, like uh -huh. a kind of text adventure. Right, yeah. Uh, and That's we cool. play it, we and we play it, and we play it. I think you saw this, didn't we? we yeah, 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 it's cool. It, it, it really feels like the most distilled basic version of the story in the game. It, I mean, it's incredibly basic. When you know when that works, when yeah. you can follow this very basic thing, then, yeah. then you can extrapolate and be like, wow, when the graphics are here, when the full performances are here, imagine what it's going to be like. And we were sort of shown that. Yeah, as, yeah. So when I'm following the story yeah. and being like, oh, I want to make this choice, I want to make this choice, and it's exciting in that state, for me as an actor that is just sort of there to, to add my performance, I'm like, wow, when this thing all comes together, it's going to be fantastic. And I, I wanted to add one thing that you're mentioning about the branching content. There's things that, that I found the most exciting were not necessarily giant story, uh, like story points where a story or uh, the narrative goes in one direction or another, but it can be just as simple as a decision that two characters make between a relationship right. and then that relationship changes. The story may continue, but the way that these characters interact, their attitude towards each other for the rest of the story has changed. And so again, from a performance perspective, very interesting and very difficult to track because you're yeah. like, wait, is this the track where we're not getting along? Is this the track that it, we are? It, it you was know, pretty it, crazy on set, wasn't it? Sometimes yeah. we get to a little uh, section and go, wait, what's happened here? Yeah, we track back we and here? figure it out. But that was really interesting. And I think from a, from a, a player's perspective, um, to go back and be like, well, if I made that tiny decision yeah. 
yeah. way back in the first act or whatever. Now I can go through this whole story where, again, the, the, the broad strokes of what happens to everybody might be the same, but the yeah. way that the characters interact is different. Like, that was cool to me. Like, no. super complex. I said, I think the, the branching stuff that games can do is so incredible. And even, like, when, you know, you play a David Cage game, you see, like, you know, what percentage, you know, people pick this or that. Mm. I, have you thought about sort of how you're going to, are you going to reveal to people sort of like what the popular branches are, the choices? And obviously, it's you know it's a little bit more branching versus like you know moral. I, but there are moral choices in some of the yeah, branches. That, I'm curious like how much you want to surface that to people about like hey, here's here's where you ended up versus where everyone else did. Yeah, we, we do we do surface that, but we we do it in our own way. So we didn't okay. we wanted to move away from percentages and stuff like that. Yeah. We wanted to kind of give players a map. Of the path they played, mm -hmm. uh, and explain the kind of cause and effect. Because you did this, then this happened, and then this happened. And we mm -hmm. get these kind of chains of okay. stuff. So well, when Detroit, people, I mean, Cage has done that a little bit too, where you can sort of like see the grid, right? So similar to that. Yeah, it's, sort of it's like kind of similar. We, it's a similar thing to what we did in Until Dawn. Yeah. It's a li it's a bit more developed, yeah. uh, and it's about so when you know we know that, that these sort of games, narrative games, people love to replay them. Uh, they, they go back, they try and save the people that got killed, or, or find different endings, or, well, it, or whatever. Someone on, you know, on Reddit's going to create the flowchart anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, some right. of that yeah, stuff like is like amazing. the work for you eventually. Yeah. Yeah. We look at those flowcharts, and wow, that's yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> that's why, because people like you said want to, you know, I understand they want to play every option, Absolutely, right? It's like, can yeah. I really do that? Yeah. Or, and you always wonder when you play a game, it's like, you know, if I pick that other option, is it really going to change? Mm. Or is it going to sort of just be like, you know, a dialogue option changes? Or is this character really going to die or not? And when they do, you're like, oh, wow, I wonder what the other yeah, I think that yeah. they're going to find it difficult with Madame Madan to, well. to build up because there's so, some of it is, is branching that's reasonably easy to track, but some of yeah. it does come through relationships. It comes through the character traits that you have. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, so we have a little, we have a, a guide that tells you the key cards of cause and effect. It doesn't tell you what you haven't encountered yet, but it kind yeah. of explains your story. And if you replay, you can head back in and that'll kind of tell you maybe different decisions to make. Yeah. Um, you know, coming out in August, so it's, it's, it's nearly done. I'm curious, Sean, like the process for you of doing this, do you go back and do shoots over time, or is it kind of one block at a time? Like, how do you, how do you act in a game like this that has so many um, choices and options? Well, in Man of Den, we did two, two shoots, yeah. big sessions, essentially. Wow. Um, they were week-long sessions, and again, it's a ton of material to fit in. But yeah. again, th th you're doing nothing but the work. There's no setup, there's no lighting, there's right. no hair and makeup. It's just you just jump in and act. Um, so for this, it was actually... You know, it felt like the story was put together, the script was done and completed, so we just went in and told wow. the story, yeah. It was actually, again, very efficient, very uh, very easy process. Um, I'm sure it must be hard because you're jumping around all these branches and, like, keeping it straight about, like, where you're at in the game, where your character's yes. at. Yes, but again, these guys had, like, flow charts yeah. and details, <laughs> and, and believe this me, we had like many, many questions where yeah. we we're about to jump into a scene, and I'm like, wait, well, we have to track ten choices back. Yeah. Because they all branch well, out. As an actor, you kind of want to know, you know, the the grounding of your a character. Always, yeah. especially in heightened emotion, especially yeah. in life and death situations. Like right. it seems kind of ridiculous. Like, well, you're scared. It's like, yeah. yes, but am I scared because Why? of this, this, yeah. this? Um, and again, maybe those are details that don't necessarily are not as important to people when they're playing because they're just experiencing right. it. But I do think that you will feel those minute changes. In I think the story it is like important this. because because you know facial mocap now is so accurate it can pick up tiny tiny emotions. Yeah. So y you have to have the right emotion in your head when you yeah. deliver oh, the line. Yeah. And it, the, you know we really see that. Yeah. Well, it's amazing what uh, you guys have done of really crafting this new genre. And yeah, I mean we loved you in Quantum Break, Sean, but Thanks. this is uh, uh, you know something that I think is. Uh, Again, something that people are going to keep playing again and again. And I think, as you said, the streaming culture. Yeah. Now it's like where the folks at home can kind of, you know, guide people and how they're going to play and where it's going to go. It's going to be super interesting. So um, excited to see more of uh, Man of a Dawn. What's coming out end of, uh, end of August, right? End of August, yeah. End of August. All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Enjoy man. the rest of you three. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for sure.